for those of you who are watching, thank you for, for tuning in. We've been working on our technical audio video issues, so it looks like we're getting there. Um, and so hopefully this, this, this time it'll come out clear. It won't be dark like it was last week and the audio will be a lot better. Um, but again, thank you for your patience with that. If you have any questions about our church, if you have any comments, uh, please feel free to reach out to us on any of our social media platforms, um, Twitter, Facebook, Instagram. Um, also, if you're going to be watching this video on YouTube, send us a comment on the bottom of, of the video, and you can also do that on Facebook. But we're here to serve you. Um, please feel free to also to go to our website, fvcelp.org, and there you'll find all the information you need about our church. Um, but also you can contact me. My number's there, email's there, um, and we'll get back to you as soon as soon as possible. But again, I really appreciate you taking the time out of your day, whatever day you're watching this or, or listening to this, whether it's live or whether it's another day. Um, it really means a lot to us that you've taken some time out of your busy schedule to, to hear this message or to watch it. So with that, I will, I'll go ahead and begin with today's message. And I've titled today's message, The King Has Arrived. And we'll be finishing off Luke chapter 19 today. So this morning, as we close out chapter 19, we're going to be looking at a couple of sections that are regularly preached on Palm Sunday. The triumphal entry, the Lord's cry over Jerusalem and the cleansing of the temple. So today we're pretty much going to be looking at what Jesus saw, what he felt, and what he did when he arrived at the city of David. So before we get into God's word, let's open up and ask the Lord to speak to us in prayer. Um, Heavenly Father, we're uh, once again we're thankful that uh, we're able just able to spend that wonderful time in, in worship with you, Lord. And now we ask that as we open up your word, that you speak to us clearly, uh, loudly, Lord. Um, speak to us as a church. Speak to us individually as well, Lord. We want to know what it is that you, you want to tell us. Use me as your instrument, as your vessel, as your tool to be able to share your truth, to, to help uh, maybe minister to those, anybody out there that's hurting, that needs, needs to hear a message from you, Lord. Um, use me in a mighty way. Again, fill this room with your spirit, Lord. Fill uh, softened hearts and softened minds. Lord, we, we look forward to, to what you have to say right now. We pray this in Jesus' name. Amen. All right, Luke chapter 19. Luke chapter 19. Luke chapter 19, verse 28. When he had said these things, he went on ahead, going up to Jerusalem. As he approached Bethpage, Bethpage and Bethany at the place called the Mount of Olives, he sent two of his disciples and said, Go into the village ahead of you. As you enter it, you will find a young donkey tied there on which no one has ever sat. Untie it and bring it. If anyone asks you, why are you untying it? Say this, the Lord needs it. So those who were sent left and found it just as he had told them. As they were untying the young donkey, its owners said to them, why are you untying the donkey? The Lord needs it, they said. Then they brought it to Jesus, and after throwing their clothes on the donkey, they helped Jesus get on it. As he was going along, they were spreading their clothes on the road. Now he came near the path down the Mount of Olives, and the whole crowd of the, of the disciples began to praise God joyfully with a loud voice for all the miracles they had seen. Blessed is the King who comes in the name of the Lord. Peace in heaven and glory in the highest heaven. Some of the Pharisees from the crowd told them, Teacher, rebuke your disciples. He answered, I tell you, if they were to keep silent, the stones would cry out. What we've just read here in, these, in this passage is Jesus' triumphal entry into Jerusalem as the eternal king, 
the promised Messiah who comes in the name of the Lord. Luke begins this section by writing in verse 28, When he had said these things, he went on ahead, going up to Jerusalem. This here is a transitional verse that marks the end of the journey to Jerusalem that began in chapter 9, verse 51, and the beginning of the next phase of Jesus' earthly ministry. Now, Jesus had a complex relationship with Jerusalem and its inhabitants. His fame had obviously spread to the people there in the city, but just as obviously they had little genuine understanding of his mission. Now, again, although his triumphal entry was significantly important, it should be noted that Luke actually just rec recorded Jesus' approach to the city and not actually his entrance. Matthew 21, verses 10 through 11, 10 and 11, and Mark chapter 11, verse 11, tell us about his entry into the city. Notice, too, that Jesus went on ahead knowing full well what was going to await him there in Jerusalem, knowing that he must endure the cross before receiving the kingdom. Thus, because he knew exactly the suffering he'd soon endure, we should admire him and not pity him. I know some people will say, oh man, poor Jesus, he's just going to go to Jerusalem and die. No, he knew what he was getting himself into. And it, I don't know, again, it takes a lot of guts, a lot of bravery, tenacity to know what to expect, to know that you're going to die, you're going to be, you're going to suffer and still walk into that city. Regardless, though, it was now Sunday before his crucifixion. Now, in case some of you are wondering, the traditional calendar for the events of the Lord's last week of ministry looks like this. Sunday, the triumphal entry into Jerusalem. Monday, the cleansing of the temple. Tuesdays, controversies with the Jewish leaders. Wednesday, apparently it was a day off, a day of rest. Thursday, preparation for the Passover. Friday, trial and crucifixion. Saturday, Jesus rests in the tomb. And Sunday, Jesus raised from the dead. Now keep in mind that the Jewish, we Jewish day went from sundown, from sundown to sundown, so that our Thursday evening would be their Friday, the day of Passover. Now, Lord willing, we'll soon be looking at most of these events as we close this, this particular chapter or this particular gospel. Well, as Jesus approached Bethpage and Bethany at the place called the Mount of Olives, he sent two of his disciples into a village to get a colt or a donkey um, for his entrance into Jerusalem. He told them exactly where they'd find the animal and what its owners would say. After the disciples had explained their mission, the owners seemed quite willing to release their colt for use by Jesus. Now, why would they do that? Why would they do that? Well, there's a couple theories. Now, one theory is that perhaps they'd been blessed previously by the ministry of the Lord and had offered it to be or offered to be of assistance to him anytime he needed it. Or, yes, perhaps God the Father just simply revealed it to him. Now, what's fascinating, too, is Jesus' statement, the Lord needs it. What an irony it is that the Lord would have need of anything, but he does. Let me just give you a few examples. Back in Luke chapter 5, verses 3 and 6, he needed a boat to preach from. In Matthew chapter 14, verses 16 through 18, he needed some loaves and some fishes in order to feed the crowd. In Matthew chapter 22, verse 19, 
he needed a coin to make a point. In Matthew 26, verse 18, he needed a room to share the Last Supper with his disciples. And in Matthew chapter 27, verse 60, he needed a tomb to raise, to rise from the dead. As you can see, our Lord chose to place himself in a position of need. In 1 Corinthians chapter 8, verse 9, Paul said, He was rich. For your sake, he became poor. Why? Well, I believe one of the reasons was in order that we might partner with him in what he wants us to do here on earth. Whether it's preaching the word or feeding the multitude, the Lord has chosen to say, I need you. So once the colt, once they had the colt, the disciples made a cushion or a saddle for the Lord with their clothes, and yes, they helped them to get on it. So as he ascended from the western base of the Mount of Olives to Jerusalem, many were spreading their clothes on the road before him. Then with one voice, with one accord, the followers of Jesus burst out in praise for all the miracles that they had seen him do. Citing, citing Psalm 118, verse 26, they hailed him as God's king and chanted that the effect of his coming was peace in heaven and glory in the highest heaven. Now it's significant that they cried peace in heaven rather than peace on earth. Why? Well, because there couldn't be peace on earth because the prince of peace had been rejected and was soon to be slain. But there would be peace in heaven as a result of the, of the impending death of Christ on Calvary's cross and his ascension up into heaven. This also means that the same angels who rejoice over one sinner who, repent, who repents now see all the heavenly glory of God's plan of sa salvation brought to fruition. As earthlings praise, praise the king on a donkey, so heaven glories in God's great work of salvation. Well, it appears as this was too much for the disciples I mean, the Pharisees to, to bear. See, they were furious. They were angry. They were livid that Jesus was being publicly honored in this way. The plan was to get rid of him, to, to get him killed, not to praise him. So they urge Jesus to rebuke or to shut up his, his followers, his disciples, don't let such blasphemy continue, they said. Well, without knowing, without knowing it, they were showing themselves to be the enemies opposing Jesus that he had described in the parable of the ten minas. If you remember, if you look back to verse 14, those enemies hated their master and said, we don't want this man to rule over us. Understand this, my friends. Nothing tells Satan and his followers that they have lost like, pra like the praises of God ringing in their ears. Satan loses because when God's people are really worshiping, their hearts and their minds are on him and not on sin, not on self, or on Satan's directions. Therefore, worship God at any time, wherever you're at, any opportunity you have. Worship Him, praise Him, uh, glorify Him. You know, if you get cut off, you know, thank Him and say, Lord, thank you that I'm alive and I didn't get killed. Thank you for giving me the patience not to give Him the finger or her the finger and not to, you know, thank you for making me a child 
of God. Thank you for salvation. I mean, just glorify and praise him whenever you have the opportunity, the chance to. In Psalm 100, verses 2 to 5, it says this, Come before him with joyful song, songs. Acknowledge that the Lord is God. He made us, and we are his. His people, the sheep of his pasture, enter his gates with thanksgiving and his courts with praise. Give thanks to him and bless his name, for the Lord is good, and his faithful love endures forever. His faithfulness through all generations. Well, how did the Lord respond to their request? Well, he responded by essentially saying that what they wanted him to do was impossible. This was the moment that God had ordained for me to receive praise. If human voices were to kept were kept silent, the stones would cry out. Now imagine that for a minute. Lifeless rocks, boulders, little pebbles. Nature itself would be shouting audible praises to God. Mind-blowing, again, the thought of that. The idea of creation itself praising God may seem strange, but passages such as Psalm 148, verses 7 through 13, Psalm 96, verses 11 and 12, speak about it. In those passages, it says trees, hills, oceans, rivers, mountains, valleys, cattle and creeping things, birds and fields were all giving praise to God. The Pharisees, though, they just didn't understand the nature of God. They spent so much time that they spent so much time talking about. Again, they were like the evil servants of the previous parable. Right before their eyes, their long-awaited king had come, and they didn't want to receive him, him as such. All they could see is a homeless, false teacher from Nazareth on a donkey. But for those who were seeing a savior and king, it was impossible for their praises to be muzzled. And it had to be shouted out as loudly as possible. Now the theme of this celebration was peace. If you remember, Dr. Luke opened the gospel with the angel's announcement of peace on earth in Luke chapter 2, verse 14. But now the theme is peace in heaven. But as I mentioned before, because the king was rejected, there could never be true peace on earth, meaning there would be constant bitter conflict between the kingdom of God and the kingdom of evil, of evil. Sadly, a perfect example of this is what we're being, what we see, what we're seeing played out in a lot of our cities today: anger and bitterness, strife and dissension, hatred and division between this group and that group, the unity and love that could only be achieved in Christ and through Christ is unattainable because they don't personally know Christ. But as Christians, we must understand that there's an ongoing war between angelic and demonic forces, between the forces of God and the forces of the devil. And so we must stay spiritually alert and avoid entangling ourselves with people and opinions that promote the, the devil's agenda. And what's that agenda? To kill and to destroy, to cause division. 
to cause blame and to destroy the love that this country has been trying to build for a lo- very long time. So we have to be careful that we don't get entangled in these things. You know, I, I we just have to, I, I really believe that if we just share, tell people we love them. And if they ask us why, because of the love of Christ. And maybe that will give you a good opportunity to share the gospel, but that's how we can really start healing as a people, as, as a nation. And we start seeing people through the eyes of God, through the eyes of Christ, and start seeing them as precious, wonderful. God created each and every one of the, every, each and every one of us, and He loves us the same. So if we can see each other in that way, I think, you know, it can break down a lot of barriers, a lot of fences. Paul told Timothy this in 2 Timothy chapter 3, verses 1 through 4. But know this, hard times will come in the last days, for people will be lovers of self, lovers of money, boastful, proud, demeaning, disobedient to parents, grateful, unholy, unloving, irreconcilable, slanders, without self-control, brutal, without love for what is good, traitors, reckless, conceited, Lovers of pleasure rather than lovers of God. Holding to the form of godliness, but denying its power. And what does he say to us, to believers? Avoid these people. Now, even though there wouldn't be be peace on earth, thanks to Christ's work on the cross, there's now peace with God. In heaven. Romans chapter 5, verse 1. In Romans chapter 5, verse 1, we're told, Since we've been justified by faith, we have peace with God through our Lord Jesus Christ. And in Colossians chapter 1, verses 19 and 20, it says, For God was pleased to have all his fullness dwell in him, and through him to reconcile everything to himself whether things on earth or in heaven, by making peace through His blood shed on the cross. So the appeal today for everyone who don't know, who don't yet know the Lord is this, be reconciled to God. Believe in Him. Trust in Him. Accept Him. And be saved by Him. All right, well, in the next section that we'll be reading, we're going, we're going to see how Jesus felt as he got near the actual city of Jerusalem and what he did when he got there. So turn with me to verse 41 and follow along as I read the rest of the chapter. As he approached and saw the city, he wept for it, saying, If you knew this day... If you knew this day what would what would bring peace, but now it is hidden from your eyes. For the days will come on you when your enemies will build a barricade around you, surround you, and hem you in on every side. They will crush you and your children among you to the ground, and they will not leave one stone on another in your midst because you did not recognize the time when God visited you. He went into the temple and began to throw out those who were selling. And he said, it is written, my house will be a house of prayer, but you have made it a den of thieves. Every day he was teaching in a temple. 
The chief priests, the scribes, and the leaders of the people were looking for a way to kill him, but they could not find a way to do it because all the people were captivated by what they heard. Well, let me ask you guys a question. Now that we, we finished reading this, maybe many of you are from El Paso, and you know, I, originally I'm from San Diego, and I was born and, and raised there. But let me ask you, have you ever loved a city so much that it's broken your heart to see that it's not the same place that it used to be? I know every time my family and I go to California and visit, go go back there and we see the differences. And there have been times we both have commented, man, what happened? It's not the same as it used to be. And it does. It it. it, it and it bums us out. Well, here, our Lord gives us his thoughts and feelings about the city he loved so much, as well as, as, well as what he did when he arrived there. So as the crowds were shouting praises that the king had arrived, Luke tells us that as Jesus approached and saw the city, of Jerusalem, he wept for it. Do you guys know that this is a second occasion on which our Lord wept openly? The first being at the tomb of Lazarus? The thing is, though, that his tears weren't for his own inevitable fate in that city, but for the fate of the city itself. He was like the prophet Jeremiah, who in Jeremiah chapter 9, verse 1, wept bitterly over the destruction of Jerusalem. Just like Jonah looked on Nineveh and hoped it would be destroyed in Jonah chapter 4, Jesus was now looking at Jerusalem and wept because it had destroyed itself. This expression, wept, wept over it, fails to really convey the depth of his, of his emotion. The best way to put it was that Jesus burst into tears. He was sobbing uncontrollably. Sorry, just to, to, to imagine Jesus crying. It's, it's, it's hard. Sorry. Um, he was crying as if he were mourning over the death of someone he loved. So this scene can be put like this. He saw it. He wept for it. And then he felt the need to say something about it. The words behind his tears were over this city that missed a golden opportunity. If they had only received him as Messiah, they would have, that would have meant peace for them. But they didn't recognize that he was the source of peace. And it was too late. They had already determined what they would do with the Son of God because of their rejection of him, their eyes were blinded. Because they would not see him, they could no longer see him. Jesus here showed the heart of God, how even when judgment must be pronounced, it's never done with joy. Even when God's judgment is perfectly just and righteous, His heart weeps at the bringing of judgment. And it was this judgment that he speaks song next in verses 43 and 44. There, in those two verses, Jesus gave a solemn preview of an event that would occur, that did occur, in 70 AD. History records that the Roman government ordered General Titus to control Jewish rebellion in the city by any means necessary. 
and just like it says, the general surrounded the city, trapped the inhabitants, massacred both young and old, and crushed the walls and buildings. So sure enough, Jesus' words were fulfilled when the city of Jerusalem was utterly destroyed by the Roman army who didn't leave one stone on another. The Jewish, the Jewish historian Josephus recorded this from that event. All hope of escaping was now cut off from the Jews. Together, their liberty of going out to the city again was cut off. Then did the famine widen its progress and devour the people by whole houses and families. The upper rooms of women and infants that were dying by famine and the lanes of the city were full of dead bodies of the aged. The children also and the young men wandered about the marketplaces like shadows, all swelled with the famine and fell down dead wheresoever their misery seized them. For a time the dead were buried, but afterwards, when they could no longer do that, they had them cast down from the wall into the valleys beneath. When Titus, when Titus on going his rounds along these valleys, saw them full of dead bodies and thick of pure purification running about them, he gave a groan and spreading his, out his hands to heaven, called God to witness that this was not his doing. And all of that, because Jerusalem did not recognize the time when God had visited it. Well, indeed, God the Son had visited his people as promised long ago through the prophets. And as we saw last week in verse 10, he had come to seek and to save the lost. Sadly, though, they refused to recognize they were lost. They refused to see God's glory in Jesus or to give God glory for sending Jesus. As a result, their beloved temple and all their glorious architecture of Jerusalem fell and not a single stone was left in place. And until the last few decades, no hope for rebuilding and renewal. So do you see now why it brought pain and tears to the Messiah when he looked at the city that he loved? No matter where Jesus looked, his heart was crushed. If he looked back, he saw how a nation had wasted its opportunities and had been ignorant of their time of visitation. If he looked within, he saw spiritual, he saw spiritual ignorance and blindness in the hearts of the people. They should have known who he was, for God had given them his word and sent his messengers to prepare the way. As he looked around, Jesus saw religious activity that didn't really do much. The city was filled with, with pilgrims because of the Passover festival, but the hearts of the people were heavy with sin and life's burdens. And as Jesus looked ahead, he wept as he saw the terrible judgment that awaited the holy city that King David had once ruled over. Truly, there is no one like Jesus, for no one else would weep compassionately for a people he knew would not only reject them, but also crucify him. What an amazing Savior. I love the Lord because he didn't give up on Jerusalem. He doesn't give up on me, and he won't give up on you. Soon after the events of the triumphal entry, 
Jesus embarked on a course of action that brought him into conflict with the religious leadership of the nation. For Luke, the, the first appearance of the city comes when he went into the temple, the place where God's Messiah was expected to appear. Upon the Lord's arrival there, he began to throw out those who had perverted the place of prayer and worship and had turned it into a commercial enterprise. At that time, the religious establishment had cornered the market of sacrificial lambs and birds and on charging money into coins that could only be used for temple offerings and purchases. They were working a scam with the pilgrims, those that were there that to, to, for the Passover. So, and, and here's how the scam worked. The merchants, in cooperation with the priests, cheated visitors to Jerusalem by forcing them to purchase approved sacrificial animals and currencies at a high price. So you see, instead of praying for the people, the priests were praying on the people. The temple had, had gone from a house of prayer to a den of thieves. G. Ma G. Campbell Morgan noted that a den of thieves is a place where thieves run to hide after they've committed wicked deeds. It was clear to Jesus that the Pharisees and the Sadducees were placing wealth above obedience. And so he had to get rid of this. He had to put a stop to this. This couldn't go on. His father's house must be pure and holy. The scammers had to go and the worshipers, the true worshipers of God, had to return, had to come back. And that's exactly what happened. And now that the house of prayer had been cleansed, it now became Jesus' classroom. There he spent every day teaching the disciples and the crowds about God's kingdom. But for the Jewish leaders, his teaching went in one ear and out the other. They didn't want to hear about it. They didn't want to know anything about it. Their only goal was to look for a way to kill Jesus. That was where their minds were set. I don't care what Jesus says. I don't care what he, you know, the hope and the love that he's sharing and, and you know, uh, uh, God's kingdom and, and to repent of their sins. Forget that. We just want to kill him. That's where their minds were set on. That's what they intended to do, again, by any means necessary. By doing this, they revealed their true nature as people who opposed and rejected the one who visited them in the name of the Lord. But they couldn't find a way to do it. Although they had their minds set on, on killing him, they couldn't find a way to do it. It wasn't God's time yet. God used the power of the, of the popular appeal to keep the religious leaders away. Jesus had become so popular that they couldn't touch him. If they did, they'd know that it was, the people would know that it would be coming from them, that it was the religious leaders who killed him, and here we go with riots and killings of the priests and the leaders, and so yeah, they weren't going to touch him. There was no way. And again, it wasn't, it wasn't time yet. See, the people hung on every word of Jesus. They were captivated by what they heard, his authority and his unique style of teaching. So, because they feared man more than God, 
religious leaders dared not cause an uproar among the people. But again, the thing is, all that power that they tried to hold on to would eventually be lost when the Roman, when Rome had to step in just as Jesus had predicted. But let me ask you, do the words of Jesus captivate you? Are you hanging by every word that's written in the Word of God? Are you like, are you reading it? You're like, oh man, I, I can't put this down. I, I need to see what's going. Wow, Jesus, what you're saying here is amazing. It's just, I've never heard something like that ever said that way. And are you hanging by every word? Is it captivating you? Is it capturing your heart, your mind? I mean, it should. The words of the Savior. So can you imagine, again, like being there in person, hearing Jesus actually speaking? People were enthralled. They were amazed at what he was saying. So the, so the stage was, was set. When and how would the passion predictions of the Messiah come true? In what way would this be a victory for the religious establishment? In what way would it be a victory for the sovereign plan of God and to save, to save, and to save the lost? How would the disciples react? How would the crowd react? Respond. Well, all these questions will be answered soon enough. So stay tuned. Now, before I come to a close, I think it's important that we quickly review, that we do a review of what Luke 19, the whole chapter showed us. I'm not going to go over the whole entire chapter, but just summarize it. And then afterwards and put it all together. Early in this chapter, the question of why Jesus came was answered. As he invited himself to a tax collector's home, the Lord Jesus made it clear that he came to seek and to save the lost. Still, though, the Jewish religious leaders bickered with him over who was lost. Of course, they didn't think they were. They felt secure in the religious system that they controlled and manipulated to their own advantage. When they saw Jesus finally approaching Jerusalem, we then saw Jesus finally approaching Jerusalem. But as wonderful as that moment was for the crowds, it was anything but that for the Lord. He looked at the holy city he loved in its unholy state and just wept for it. He pronounced judgment on it and its inhabitants because they had rejected him, the one who represented God, the one who represented God's visit to the city. At long, at long last, having entered the city, it was necessary for Jesus to reclaim the temple because it, was, it had given way to legalistic religion and secular commerce. He drove out the shady merchants and restored order, the order of prayer and worship that God had intended for a brief moment in time. The king arrived and reclaimed his home. But soon he would go off to a far-off country, meaning he would go to heaven. His prophecy of destruction would come true. Yet, as all this was going on, Luke tells us that the religious leaders were just looking for a way to kill him. Brothers and sisters in Christ, let me reiterate again that Jesus came to, came to earth to seek and to save the lost. He found us while we were yet sinners. He died for us. 
Now he rules in heaven at God's right hand, watching as we carry out the responsibilities that he assigned us. He's watching you as you carry out the responsibility that he assigned you. The question is, are you doing that? Meanwhile, we join the disciples at the triumphal entry in singing Christ's praises. We also join Christ in looking at a lost world that has rejected him and will not accept him as Savior. Seeing the world around us, the state of things, not just in our country, but around the world, the horrible things going on, it should fill our eyes with tears as they did his. But while we await for his return, we ought to be on a search and find mission with Jesus after the lost. Sadly, though, that mission needs to begin within the walls of many American churches that have allowed business and human greed to take over the house of prayer, God's house of prayer. So if we sincerely want and are praying for revival, then it must start inside the church by having a good thorough cleansing those who are using it as a den of thieves must be kicked out and replaced with true worshipers of God. And once it's been purified, we must let Christ's teaching once again become the central concern of our church, of the American church. And then that's when I think we'll begin to see revival. And churches to start concentrating on the Word of God, on teaching what the Word of God says, not their own agendas, not their own you know, philosophies and whatever feels good. Simply the Word of God. We must hang on every word He says. Not because we want to be captivated, not because we want to be captivated to see an extraordinary miracle, but because we know that obeying his teaching is the only way to meaningful life here and the eternal life hereafter. So now, as I come to the end, I want to ask those that are watching, listening, is this what you're seeking? Are you seeking to, for Jesus to find you? Are you seeking to be captivated by Jesus' words? Is this something that you've been searching for, that you've been seeking for a very long time? Well, let me tell you, the search is over. The Lord has come to seek you out and to save you. Are you ready for that? Are you ready for salvation? Maybe you're watching again and, and you know that the Lord has been pulling you in his direction. And time after time, you've said, nope, I'm not ready. Nope, don't want to do it. I'm okay. I'll, I'll be all right. I'll be okay. I can. I can make it. I can make it. But the further away, the further and further you walk away, it just gets harder and harder. The Lord's telling you, "I'm right here. You don't have to get. Lo You're not lost. I'm right here. I found you. And I just come and get saved." Well, you can do that. You can come to the Lord, fall on your knees, and ask Him to forgive you of your sins. And he will come in and forgive you for all that you've done. Wipe the slate clean. Make you white as snow so that you can stand before God completely innocent. 
and so that he won't have to judge you as guilty for all your sins. Jesus paid the price. He hung on that cross. The nails were put in his hands and feet to, for the punishment that you deserved. He got all, he, all this stuff that he got, you, we should have gotten because of our sins. We should have gotten even worse. He didn't do anything. He was an innocent man. But again, he took on the punishment that we deserved. Are you ready to be born again, to be saved? If you are, I want you to close your eyes and bow your head and with all sincerity pray this. Lord Jesus, I know and I admit that I'm a sinner and I'm sorry. I ask for your forgiveness. I believe that you died on the cross for my sins and rose from the dead three days later. And so now, today, at this very moment, I turn from my sins and confess you as my personal Lord and Savior. Thank you, Jesus, for saving me. And I, I now ask you to fill me with the Holy Spirit so that he may help guide me in my new born-again life. In your name, amen. Simple prayer. The Lord doesn't want to make it all complicated. He just wants you to, to come to him and ask for forgiveness. And if you really prayed that, there are angels rejoicing right now because you've accepted him, because you're now born again. If you did that, we want you to contact us and let us know all about it. We want to help you in your next steps. We want to maybe lead you to a church or invite you to come here and maybe show you where you can begin reading the Bible and maybe... Uh, you know, read a couple, you know, chapters with you. Um, but contact us, contact me, and and uh, we'll let you, we'll get back to you as soon as we can. But again, we uh, we want to hear from you, from you, and we want to be blessed by your story. We have an amazing Savior. Jesus loves, has so much patience and compassion and love, and it makes me want to be more like Him. Because I and I tell you what, I have so much, I have a lot more to go. You know, and and I hope that He continues to to do that for me. And if that's what you desire as well, keep asking Him for that love and that patience, that compassion. He will give it to you. But again, let's continue to 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 glorify Him, to praise Him, in in what He's done, what He's going to continue to do here, and. Um, we're we're just looking forward to 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 what we're going to see next in the next few chapters. So, let's close in in prayer. Heavenly Father, thank you for again this time, and thank you for using me to to share this message. I pray that it's gone out there powerfully, that it's spoken to people, that it's or that it's at least been planted as seeds in the hearts of people, Lord. And that over time, I pray that you will water it and that you will make it grow, Lord, so that it turns into a beautiful tree and bear beautiful, good fruit. So I pray for all those that I prayed that prayer and just received your son as their Lord and Savior, and protect them, watch over them, and bring people, good Christians, good, strong, worshiping believers that will come and help guide them in their next steps. Bless this upcoming week, Lord. We pray for more, for, for calm in this country. We pray for reconciliation. We pray for peace. 
We pray for our leaders. We pray for our law enforcement. We pray for those that have been hurt or that they've, these people that have been hurt, that justice will come soon. But if not now, we know that in eternity, they will, in, in your heaven, in your throne, they will, justice will be served. We pray this in Jesus' name. Amen.